Hey, welcome everybody back to the Library of Things collab coordinated by Shareable. Uh, nice to see a lot of returning faces. And also this time we got a lot of new faces. So welcome to the collab. This is the, I believe, 15th session um, of this series. And we have been documenting the ins and outs of starting and running and growing a library of things. So just want to invite folks that who haven't already to please mute yourself um, so we don't catch you in the recording. Um, this session is being recorded. We will be posting the, the video to YouTube, but we will also be sharing the, um, the presentation deck you're about to see and any resources on Canvas, which uh, Candice, maybe you can go ahead and post a link to that. So this is where we've just been collecting all of the resources from the course. You can find everything that's been shared up to this point on there as well. So today's session, number 15, is going to be focusing on community governance. And we're fortunate to have Leanna Frick and Kate Hersey um, joining us uh, for this session uh, to be co-presenters. And this session is coming out of a poll that we did at a previous uh, Library of Things collab about things that you know people that were participating in the collab want to go deeper into. So we're going deeper today. Um, there's going to be presentation. There's going to be interactivity. There's going to be times for question and answer. Um, please do utilize the chat. We found this chat is uh, a really good resource that people sharing ideas along the way. And there's a lot of folks that are already have been running libraries of things that are on this um, session as well. So it's not all newbies. So something comes up, you say, you know, this is something that's been that we've been doing really well in our section, or you've got a question um, coming from experience or some pain points you've already been experiencing. Please do drop those in the chat and we will be uh, saving this chat and sharing it on Canvas as well. Um, the final piece of housekeeping is that you'll notice that some of us have pizzas at the beginning of our names. Um, that just represents that the folks with pizza are members of the shareable team, which is hosting the session. So if you want to have any issues you, you need to um, you want to address or, or something comes up, you can feel free to do a direct message to anybody with a pizza in front of their name and they can help assist you as well. Um, so without further ado, I think I'm going to pass it off to Liana to get started. Yeah, thanks, Tom. It's really great to be back with everyone. Um, I was uh, very lucky to present on governance structures the first time around. So if you're interested in more about my library and how we run things, you can go back into Canvas, watch that session. But today we're going to dive into community governance. And I assume because you're here, you believe in community governance or at least curious about it. But I want to start, um, oh, here's a little bit about me, sorry. Uh, I've been with my tool library actually um, nine years next month uh, as a volunteer and then a board member, a teacher, and now on staff. Um, my co-presenter, Kate. I've been with the Tua Library for about five years here um, in Minnesota. And my background uh, before that was in nonprofit management and leadership development. So very happy to do that on this session today. <laughs> Yeah, so why community governance? Um, even if you are already fully bought in, we're hoping that this will help you um, get others on board as well, because you're going to leave here and then go talk to other people. That's what community governance is. Um, so the reason that we believe in community governance here at the Station North School Library in Baltimore is that it's part of our mission, right? We share things, we share power. Community resources include the library itself. So when we think about sharing resources, our library is one of those resources to share. Um, so you might think about how your mission or vision statement calls you to rethink how your organization is managed or how to set it up in the first place. We believe in sharing a sewing machine. Don't we also believe in sharing that decision about what kind of sewing machine people need? Um, so yeah, it's really just an invitation to think about sharing as uh, an act and not just an idea. But also representation really matters. So you can't have a, an advisory group or a board that includes every single person in your community. But the more decisions and conversations and input you make public, you get voices in the room, the more responsive and adaptive your library will be to the people who need it. One of our go-to phrases here at SNTL is nothing about us about us. This has actually been around since the 1500s, this idea that if a decision affects you, you should have some say in it, you should be able to participate in it. 
Um, and so this representative power is a really essential part of community governance. The other thing is we are building a movement, right? Being here with Shareable is a really, really exciting moment in this movement that's been building for about 20 years, but it's not the last bit, right? We have a lot of work to do to spread the idea of a circular economy, of a sharing economy, of the idea of libraries and things in general. And so the more people you get involved in your library, who become advocates for your library, who have a stake in it, the more we spread the idea of libraries of things. So we've had volunteers who were really deeply involved in our library who moved to other cities and started them. I just visited um, some former volunteers who helped start the Providence Library of Things in Rhode Island. Um, so essentially, the more people we can get involved, the more we can share power, the more we beat capitalism. That's my personal approach. <laughs> Um, there are some key considerations. I'm going to be doing just a very high level overview and then handing it over to Kate. Um, and I was very excited that Kate joined us because I am really uh, impressed by the way that Minnesota has balanced a lot of these considerations. So we often start um, by talking about engaging our community and coming from a nonprofit background as well. My question is always engagement and what, right? What does that mean? So I would really challenge you as you go through either establishing your governance um, or revamping your governance to not use that word. Say what you really mean and think about what you really mean. So some examples are, if you just wanna make people aware of what's going on, of decisions that have been made, of the fact their library exists, that's the outreach, right? That's just telling people. If you're asking people for specific input, but you've already decided what the options are, that's a poll. If you're inviting people to decide between things, that's a vote. If you're inviting people into the conversation where the options are being chosen, the plans are being made, that might be inclusion. You're including people. But if the group that shapes the table and the conversations has the option for everybody to join it, that's equity. That means everybody actually is participating. They're engaged. So think really carefully before you talk about community engagement, community outreach. What is it that you're really hoping that people will do as a result of that? It can be scary, right? <laughs> but that's why we talk about defining our roles. So these are some slides from our last presentation. This is some of the most important things for me in thinking about successful co community governance is just clarity. If people understand the role that they're being asked to take, they're generally much more successful in it. Um, there's a concept called procedural justice, where if people feel like they have been part of the process from beginning to end, whatever the outcome is, they tend to support it a little bit more and be happy about it. And if you help people understand their role in a larger ecosystem, that's also helping them understand what other roles they could have in the future. So if a member really wants to have more of a say, maybe they apply for a position on your board. Um, you know, maybe they show up to your member meetings and they participate in voting. Um, so helping people see the whole picture of your community governance model also helps them opt into more responsibility if they want to. So this is an example of um, one way that we have done what we call a, a racy chart or a roles chart. And this is kind of going back to this last slide, thinking about people's different roles in decision-making, right? Who has the authority to decide something? Who's responsible for accomplishing it? Who has the administrative leadership there? Who is a key contributor to this decision? Whose opinion could make or break whether you do something? And then how is this being supported and evaluated and made sure that it's actually happening? This is more about like getting things done. And then this simpler version of a racy chart is really like who is responsible for this um, getting done? Who holds the bottom line for making sure that those that team of people gets it done? Whose input is considered and who is just informed of the decision that comes out of it? Um, and again, these are um, these will be in the slides in Canvas. These are also in the community or in the governance um, session that we did previously. So I just think it's really important once you have all these structures in place and you know theoretically how everything should happen, uh, that's when it gets really messy, right? Because people are messy and communities are messy and that's part of what makes it beautiful. I'm sure none of our libraries are perfectly organized. Um, so it's important to keep some questions in mind the whole time and to keep coming back to them. So who is making the decisions versus who has to implement them, right? This is a really big one in workplaces. Like you decided I have to 
check every single member's ID and record it. I don't have time to do that at the front desk. Also, whose voices are loudest? So if you theoretically have a representative group, who is speaking up the most? Who gets listened to the most? Often this has to do with social identity. White folks, men, older people um, tend to come across loudest, even if it's not literally louder. And they tend to also be more comfortable speaking up. So keep an eye on that. Who has been explicitly empowered to lead versus implicitly empowered? Um, we have about 100 volunteers and teachers. Some of them have formal roles. Some of them just step up a lot and people tend to listen to them. So it's important to keep that in mind as well. And then who is being affected by choices that they can't influence? Again, nothing about us without us. It's a really good test to make sure that the process that you're planning is gonna be accountable to the people that it affects. And that's it for me. I'm gonna hand it over to Kate um, and I'm gonna keep doing the slides. So Kate, if you need me to move on and I haven't, let me know. Oh, I think you need to come off mute. Thank you. I was okay. being smart and making sure I didn't say anything whilst you were on. Um, <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit about how community governance works at the Minnesota Tool Library. And nonprofits are messy, right? Joan Gary, who is fabulous, if you haven't looked um, at her information in terms of, of nonprofit management resources, she always says nonprofits are messy. Um, and that is especially the case in a community governance model. And one thing I really want to reiterate and um, you know drive home is that it is a continuous process, right? There is never a policy um, with this model that is set in stone, right? <laughs> you are always reevaluating and, and coming into things. So if we go over to the next slide, this is kind of the hierarchy and, and what the tool library in Minnesota looks like. Um, so we are a traditional 501c3. We are a membership-based organization. Um, so that is where we get a, a good portion of our revenue. Um, we are a very cooperative, highly volunteer driven, and we have a, a very much a team governance model, but we are not officially a co-op, right? And so one thing to keep in mind is as you form your organizations and you look at, you know, what's in my current bylaws, right? There is a difference and how you run your organization doesn't necessarily have to align perfectly with your legal classifications, right? So, so you can employ elements of community governance, whether or not you are member owned or member driven, whether you're a co-op, whether you officially have co-directors or just have kind of team setups in different um, portions of your organization. So what we have here um, in this chart, you'll see in, in white, we have kind of the flow of power, that idea of um, kind of hierarchical leadership and how that works throughout all of our um, key stakeholders. In gray, you'll see kind of where um, those people who are responsible for those items are and who have the accountability for, for doing the individual tasks kind of which directions those all run. And then you'll see in blue, who is consulted and informed. And this is where Leanne was talking about kind of that outreach component, right? These are the people who, who were letting know what's happening and we're taking some input from, um, but they're a, a step below from kind of the day-to-day -day operations. So in terms of the Minnesota Tool Library, we've been around for 10 years. We start with our 1,700 active member households. When it comes to kind of what they do governance-wise, they are responsible for seating and selecting our board, right? They are responsible for helping set our organizational goals and priorities. And they really help provide um, input into all facets of the organization so that it best serves their needs. Right. From member based organizations, these are our client. These are our day to day users. Right. They're the, the biggest kind of crew for us. Um, next, we have our board of directors. Uh, we 
uh, use a seven to 11 person um, member board. Um, we have the traditional executive roles of treasurer, secretary, and president as required by our state law. Um, we have two year renewable terms and we use a self-perpetuating board. So instead of formal member elections annually where those participatory rates can be less than ideal, especially after you've been around for a while, um, the existing board is actually the one to ratify new additions to the team um, and uh, to kind of work with all of our formal motions, right? So our board uh, engages in a monthly hybrid meeting. And the key here for participatory governance is that it's open to all, right? Our board members are there, it's open. Any member, any stakeholder, any friend of the library can come in and they can sit in on our board meeting and they can join us. Um, and not only can they sit there and, and you know they get the information, but they are encouraged to participate in that dialogue and participate in that discussion. So it's not just a member, uh, uh, you know, them being a fly on the wall. Um, so they do that uh, meeting that we have an annual strategic planning retreat. And depending upon the capacity, uh, we do up to four social slash professional development activities per year with our board. And so for us, um, our members have basically, in essence, given our board proxy for ease and efficiency, right? But they're still informed, they're still invited to participate. Everyone's welcome to engage in those leadership meetings to share their perspectives. And if there happens to be a motion, everyone is eligible to vote on that motion. And their vote is weighted no differently than any other participant, which is also really key there. Um, our board meetings typically run an hour and a half to two hours. Um, and about an hour of that is kind of a status of the library, a status of here's where all of our programming is and, and reporting from um, each of our leadership committees. And the other hour tends to be um, more kind of active discussion. Um, we have a working board and that is what most tool libraries that I've seen have, especially as they're starting out, right? An advisory board in a traditional nonprofit capacity is looking at their fiduciary responsibilities. They're looking at their strategic responsibilities, but they don't have their hands in the day-to-day -day operations. Um, and most of us have working boards, right? <laughs> Where we are, um, in addition to providing that fiscal oversight and strategic direction and the regula regulatory compliance, our board members are doing the daily operations of the library directly. Um, and one of the things that we use and, and one of the resources that I'll share out is we use specific board support goals to help our members identify where they're gonna pitch in and clearly delineate, this is my strength, this is what I'm providing for the organization, whether it's financial or whether it's in a realm of marketing and, or whatever it happens to be so that there's fluidity for everyone. Um, in terms of how many non-board members show up at meetings, it is totally different by the meeting. So we probably have um, the meetings and, and the strategic planning meetings that are right before kind of year end and pull into our, our budget for the next following year and, and have kind of heavy activity pieces. We usually have about 20 additional members who are participating there. We have members from our, our leadership committees kind of report to the board and then sometimes are, are there for part, part of a meeting. Um, but each meeting, we usually have two or three members um, and they don't, they're not usually the same faces um, unless they're thinking of maybe joining the board at some point. Um, in the future. So that's kind of our board of directors and, and how their role works. Um, 
As the executive director, I come next. I report to the board officially, right? Their job is to evaluate my performance, to set my pay and any bonuses. They can kick me out the door if I'm not performing to their satisfaction, right? That is the, the role of a board. Um, but as ED, I'm responsible for ensuring that as an organization, we meet our goals, right? For setting the how of our work plan, plan for enforcing those policies and procedures and making sure really that the lines of communication are open and flowing in all directions. If you look at kind of that flow chart, there are a lot of arrows stemming from me and, and coming to me. <laughs> um, I think what's really important to know it is, is I'm not a big cheese, right? My persona is just slightly larger than that of our front line. Um, and that's also really intentional. Um, I'm the talking head that's credited just as often as our other staff or our other volunteers, right? If we're doing um, PR, I'm going to say, okay, who in our organization is the best person to put in front of that? I'm not going to be the person um, out front all the time. Um, our other staff and volunteers, the other thing is our compensation rates also codify that equity admits the team. Um, so that's other, another thing to look when you're looking at kind of where does that power lay in that structure. Um, at MTL, our pay rates from the lowliest intern to the highest ranking staff member dif differ by only $10 an hour, right? And so that also is very intentional as we're looking at where our staffing is going. Um, as the ED, I have full authority to make staffing decisions. Um, and we are very lucky at the Tool Library to have a staff of nine. We are all part-time, <laughs> um, but our staffing um, includes myself, our branch management team. Uh, we have three people who share the open hours for each branch. So um, one works kind of equally at both sites, but we don't have just one branch manager at each one of our sites. Um, and we have um, our volunteer coordinator, a programming coordinator, and then our ops coordinator who really helps with special projects and backup coverage. So that's kind of our staffing model. No one person is solely responsible for the library or for any one facet of our programming. It's all shared. And that makes it very messy, especially when you go into those charts, right? You know, who's doing what? Who do I talk to? Who has that final authority, right? Um, so I think it's really interesting. You know, we split that model for our staffing um, because it was a lot to work every weekend and evening, right? It was frying our staff members to have kind of a a half-time position where they were in charge of everything that happened at the library. Um, and then it also resulted in these participation silos, right? So especially if you're looking at having multiple locations and they're doing different things, right? We had a different silo for our members just based on like this cult of personality, right? And how each staff member handled minor operation tasks um, due to their kind of personal strengths and weaknesses. Um, and so by spreading that responsibility, we're able to maintain a much more balanced and holistic engagement and take advantage of the individual strengths and weaknesses, right? We have some branch managers who really love and are passionate about and really great at doing repairs, but not all of them are. Um, and so they can take a little bit more of that repair burden um, in terms of the operations at the library but they're not taking all of it, right? So even our staff members who are not the repair gurus um, can't, can't walk away from doing that piece, right? Um, the staff is supported and kind of filled out with volunteers on our leadership committees. So we use a committee structure um, for pretty much most of those core nonprofit management tasks at the library. Uh, our committee structure consists of advancement, 
programming, engagement, um, which really deals with member and volunteer engagement, and then finance. And those volunteers serve as task forces for that traditional department staffing that we don't have as paid positions, which is where most of you are probably starting out and will probably be for a number of years. Um, members of our finance committee code our accounting. Advancement members write our grants. They design and run our annual campaign. Engagement sends out that member correspondence. It tracks data. It plans social events. Programming helps with the logistics and admin of the core library ops, like inventory management and implementation of our workshops. So each committee has members who have elected specific tasks. Um, and those that work more as generalists, doing a little bit of this and that. They also have at least always have one staff and one board representative, um, often more, that serve on those committees, right? So it's integrated throughout kind of that whole structure, right? They're never disconnected. Um, like our board meetings, those committee meetings, um, which can be anything from like every two weeks for like a smaller programming task force for an event to our standard committees, which generally are meeting monthly, um, although finance only meets quarterly. <laughs> um, those are also open to the public, right? Um, those are where our stakeholders, our participants, and our members are really invited to engage. So the committee structure is where we begin to build all of those policies, where we have those initial governance discussions. Um, and those are often stemming from logistical pinch points, right? So, hey, we're finding out that three people are in terms of different staff or different volunteers at the library are approaching late fees differently, right? We need a, a dedicated policy because it's too hard for everyone, you know, they're not getting that that same um, experience at the library. And so that's when we sit down and go, okay, what are the issues? What are we seeing right now? What are different options? We have some members who will go and do research and pull in best practices. We have some members who will talk to all the members and say, oh, well, as a branch manager, I can tell you this is what I do and this is what works. Or this is, again, you you can't ask me to quantify this. It's really hard to do, you know, in the, the five minutes that I have with a member. Um, and so we could build a policy that really made sense for everyone. Um, that's also where the majority of our strategic planning goals and our metrics um, take place. So in those committees, each of those committees and everyone who's there is identifying, they're saying, here are the priorities for the year. Here are the metrics that we think are approachable. That's not coming from on high. It's not coming from myself or the board or from the staff telling the volunteers, hey, we wanna make sure we get to 1700 loans this you know, per month. Um, they're coming from kind of the crew themselves and similarly, that's where the budget implications are set and tracked for each fiscal year. Um, so as we kind of move through those staff and those leadership volunteers, right, those are our, our, our bigger heads. Um, then we move into, into the hands, which are our daily op volunteers. They are our second track of de facto staff at the Tool Library. Um, they are the individuals that are on site for open hours as librarians and shop mentors. There are individuals who are teaching classes. They are those uh, racy responsible powerhouses for many of our operational tasks. Um, and often they're the face of the library for our program participants. So they are also our information highways. So within this crew, we have individuals of the team that practically live at the library, right? We have our lifers who are in whenever we're open. Um, and we have those that engage once a quarter. After our daily op volunteers, the next part of our team are our members and our program participants. And we do not differentiate between um, 
if someone actually has an ongoing membership status in, in terms of how they participate in the library or if they are just uh, event participants. So for us, um, we do public programming in terms of all of our classes, where you, whereas you have to be a membership member to use the shop or um, to borrow tools properly. Um, members are slightly bigger, right? Um, just because uh, they have heavier engagement and they have a little bit more buy-in at the library. But the perspective of a member and a perspective of a program participant for us is really equally valued. So being a member or being a member at X level, if you have a tiered system, does not add any significant weight or power to your votes. Um, and then the final stakeholders in community governments are our larger community partners, right? Our donors, our friends, our program partners, those organizations that we do joint classes with, our local community. For us, we think about that in terms of the neighborhoods. So Minneapolis and St. Paul can be called the Twin Cities, right? But those cities have a very different ethos, and that's further delineated within the ecosystems that are tiny little local neighborhoods. Como is very different from Rondo, Northeast from Nokomis. Um, and so each one of our libraries is working kind of within this different subset um, of neighborhoods and, and these very different cultures um, that do affect kind of those decisions that we make and who we're engaging and how we're engaging them. We also think more broadly about the sectors and the fields we work with. So thinking through where your mission overlaps and your programming overlaps. For us, that's reuse, it's the environment, it's trades, it's art. Um, these stakeholders really both passively and actively affect our decisions and important it's really important that we don't make assumptions on their behalf. And I think that's one of the big lessons in community governance is that you cannot make an assumption based on, on a group you're trying to engage or you are engaging without their, their true feedback, right? They have to be actively engaged in the planning and decision-making process. Um, as often as many touch points as you can possibly, possibly have. And there are two other kind of people in this power structure that we haven't talked about. And those are the fund, uh, or founders. And that's uh, something that's really important, especially for our nonprofit members. Um, when you're getting to that point where you're growing beyond some of your founders, uh, we started with co-founders. Um, one was focused more on ops and one focused more on admin. They are still in those roles today at our organization. Um, founders um, generally will sit on the board. Often they may be the first paid staff at an organization, but it is really important that as that organization grows, they step back and make space for others. Um, and that their governing power is only equal to the roles that they fulfill. Um, and as you have access to the PowerPoints, I'll just note here that all of all of my speaking points as well, I, I have in here. So you will have exactly what that breakdown is for those of you who are interested in the committees and their duties. Um, I can also list um, on our fact page, you can see in the Get Involved page, you can see each committee and kind of how we've broken down what their core tasks are as well. So I'll include that. One other thing that we used um, because we have two different sites is that when we started out, we had labs, uh, local advisory boards, which were basically little mini tiny boards of directors for each site. Um, and that is a model that we retain for startups and we retain that for kind of franchise sites as we grow, especially for locations which are further out of state. Um, but what we found was it gets really messy when you're creating affiliates like that. Um, and those lines of, of power and who's responsible for X, Y, or Z in, in those bylaws just, I mean, 
it was four pages and you had to go, who's doing this again? Um, so we swapped that model a little bit where those local advisory boards are the powerhouse as we're getting another location up and running, right? But they then are set to merge into our primary committees and our board structure um, once that site is open and once that location is active. Um, and again, it's to keep from having those silos. So that's kind of how we work at the Minnesota Tool Library. And I'll give you a feel for how all those different pieces come together and, and who's um, playing in, in that government segment. <laughs> so as we go down, I want to move us to some role play as we think through this. Okay. Yeah, and I just want to just give you a heads up. So we have enough people that we're going to split into four rooms, and we have a couple of other uh, facilitators which will be taking those on. And then Kate will be leaving you in the main room, and we're going to set it up so everybody could enter in the conversation they want to talk about. And it's, you know, the we say with open space, it's the law of two feet. So if you find yourself in a room and nobody else is joining in on that conversation, feel free to pop out and pop into another one. Yeah. So what we wanna do is thinking through this model, we wanna think about, I want you to think of, of two things, right? Team A is going to be the, the thought process of in a, in a traditional hierarchical for-profit model, who's at the table, right? How are they engaged? Who's doing what in that racy chart? And how might that governance decision play out? And then compare it to a community governance model, right? One that is more participatory, whether that's having team leads or co-leads, whether that's having more of a full cooperative structure. And the goal, right, there's no right or wrong, <laughs> but the goal is really to get you thinking about how the logistical details of making that governance decision might be different between those two models. Right. If you're using participatory governance, what is that going to look like? Who do you need to engage and how do you need to engage them compared to uh, a traditional for profit business model? Right. And so we have five very common tasks right? Very five, very common governance decisions that have to be made in any tool library. <laughs> and so we can do the quick breakout. I'll stay with the first one in terms of hiring a new staff member. And I put to manage volunteers so it can focus in, but you know, the same process applies no matter what staff member you might be thinking of hiring. <laughs> We have building and ratifying the budget for whatever the next fiscal year is. We have setting strategic goals and what that associated work plan might look like. We have deciding whether or not to pursue a particular grant or a particular project. And we have buying new tools for the inventory. Yep, so I'm gonna go ahead and open these rooms up. Um, and again, you should, you're should you gonna be able to choose which rooms you wanna to go to. We've got facilitators that are gonna be in each one of those. Um, and so I'm gonna open those up right now. And then um, you should, if you go down to the bottom um, where you see more, um, you should be able to click on breakout rooms and choose which breakout room you want to join. Does everybody have that that opportunity? Yep, and it's looked like move people are moving over. So that is working out good. Yep. Um, and then, as we said, um, Kate is going to stay in this main room and discuss um, hiring a new staff member to manage volunteers and or whatever other purposes that staff member <laughs> might do. And if you're looking at the breakout room piece, scroll down and you will see the actual rooms and the join piece. <laughs> okay. 
Great. And um, can you just real quick, one more time, uh, Kate, uh, reiterate the directives for that conversation? Sure. So you want to think about in a traditional hierarchical governance model versus a community governance model, who's at the table in that decision? How are they engaged? So think of that RACI chart, right? Who's responsible for that? Who's accountable for the decision? Who's being informed of it? Who's being consulted, right? And think about how that decision might play out. All right, I'm going to go ahead and send that uh, broadcast to everybody in the breakout rooms and go ahead and uh, get started in this one, Kate. Perfect. <laughs> All right, so I'm seeing a handful of other people. Please feel free to take yourself off of mute now that you're, we're in the, the breakout room session. <laughs> <laughs> and if you have video, please feel free to pop onto video. It's always nice to see faces. It is, it is. <laughs> Anyone able to come on on camera? Here, Some folks are already moving around from one to another. No, uh, there was nobody showed up for the setting a budget for next year. So um, that's always that's never fun, right? Yep. <laughs> yep. We're always going to push that decision a little bit further. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I think this is us. Yeah. Okay. So, and I am not seeing any other members, not, let me, there we go. I'm going to show my non-video participants here, at least, so I can get a, get a good feel <laughs> for, for who's in the room. Got to change my, change my setting here. So hiring new staff is always fun. Um, if we think about it in terms of a traditional governance model, right, you have a budget set for the year. And an ED would traditionally say, I need to hire someone to do this. Here's what I have in my budget. They might toss um, the specific tasks of writing a job description um, to like an individual program coordinator or director. Um, and they may or may not engage some of the higher level members of their leadership team in the hiring process. Right. So they might in include staff in in kind of the day to day scheduling of of those interviews. They might include a few people from that team uh, to sit in on an interview and offer feedback. But generally, it's going to be in a smaller organization, the ED or whoever that next program director is in a larger organization. Right. That's making that decision. Who is hiring that staff member who is saying, you know, here's who I'm selecting for the role. And once they're hired, they'll hand them off to an HR person, right, to get them oriented or may hand them off to um, other members of the team in terms of their day-to-day -day, um, job capabilities. But how might that be different in a community governance model? Who else do you think might be involved? Well, one thing I just was going to flag um, is the the change of uh, power dynamic, especially when, like you were saying, oftentimes the first hires are somebody who was a founder or co-founder or was a board member and moving from that horizontal level where nobody's getting paid yep. to all of a sudden one person is getting paid. 
And what are they doing that justifies that beyond what they were doing when they were a volunteer? What are they doing beyond that? Then, you know, what the other volunteers are continuing to do, um, you know, is it related to need? Is it related to output? Um, and how do you navigate that change in role? It's, it's very different in a kind of nonprofit uh, than it is in a for-profit structure of somebody just being hired in to join their role Huge. or somebody who was a volunteer, <laughs> let's say, who's now been hired in some way, right? And so that, like, <laughs> setting that, like, having this, uh, the agreements set for that, and mm -hmm. so that could be, be a lot, you know, to reduce the amount of friction there um, requires a, a significant amount of intention. Yeah, it requires a really much more concrete if we're if we're specifically looking at like the logistical tasks of hiring a staff member, right? It requires a much more concrete job description, right? There has to be a much, much better um decision making process on the front end in, in terms of, of financially, what's our ROI? What's our return on investment for hiring this staff person? versus having a volunteer do it, right? You need a lot more buy-in because you're a smaller group. The more collaborative you are, the more buy-in you have to have. At a larger for-profit organization, if I don't like who I'm working with, if I don't like that manager or I don't like that boss, I, I'm i just kind of out of luck, right? I'm up the creek without a paddle. I have to deal with it or leave. In a community government's model, you have to have buy-in from all those stakeholders, right? If I'm looking at managing volunteers, my volunteers who are already in existence need to be okay with that hire. They need to feel that they had enough input into not only who was being hired, but what they were being hired to do, right? they have to realize that that ROI is great for the organization, both kind of on that ground level, but then also when you get into the leadership volunteers and the board, right? Um, you need to know who's responsible for those tasks. Who are they reporting to? So in my model in the tool library, when we look at hiring new staff, usually like most things, it comes from a pinch point, right? The organization is saying, here's a need we have, how do we best fill it, <laughs> right? And we've identified that we have the best ROI hiring a staff member, right? Because we can't fit in those tasks, those job duties with who's currently at the table, right? We need to pull someone else in. And so we just hired our first volunteer coordinator as a paid staff this summer. And that process included, once we had said, yeah, we want to do this, right? We're going to make this a strategic priority. And the board, because it was a new position and it was not budgeted, they had to allocate those resources, right? They had to say, yes, we're going to do that. That motion had to be passed. But before that, we had to say, okay, what is it going to cost us, right? We had to build out this job description. and we built out in a Google document, that is what we we use all shared documentation mm -hmm. for everything. And if you look at any of these things and you look at the history, I think it's really fun. You can see like three months of conversations about just what should this person's role be, right? What should the breakout of their time be? Um, we go through it, we work through it, we took that and, and workshopped it. We brought it to every leadership committee. We brought it to the daily ops volunteers. We floated it past our members for input. We floated it past and thought about our other stakeholders, right? Who are the people who might fund this position? What do they need to have in it, right? So a lot of times as a, as a nonprofit, right, just in general, we're a, a little more reliant on who those mm -hmm. stakeholders are. <laughs> um, and so we had to put all of that together. We worked on that Google Doc for two to three months before we were ready to post it publicly and even get 
you know, get those um, applicants. Then we had to decide which applicants are we actually going to screen and interview. For us, because we want to make sure that we don't lose anyone, we pretty much talk to everyone, at least an initial mm -hmm an initial talk, and then we go through the next round of interviews. And our second round of interviews at the tool library, we invite all the staff. I mean, it's a small team, so we can do it. Mm -hmm. But we invite all the staff. We invite our core volunteers and our leaders who are working there. And, and my goal is always to have at least one staff representative, at least one kind of member volunteer representative in, in the room each time, and it might be different, but we yeah. have to use um, a different, you know, rating scales and, and, you know, Likert scales and everything so that everyone's perspectives, right? Even if there are two different people in that room for that interview, we're assessing the same things, yep. right? Which means we can't just walk into an interview and have five questions and say, hey, right? We have to be a lot more prepared when we're making those decisions um, so we can evaluate them equitably. Um, we had to look at where that staff member is fitting within the hierarchy of the organization, right? The power hierarchy of the organization that dictated where their price point was a little bit in terms of, um, you know, what their pay scale was going to be or what the potential for their pay scale was. Mm -hmm. um, we also, right, within an organization, and this is where the nonprofits get messy, right? Traditional nonprofit best practice roles is that the ED, right, or whoever is comparable in that role, mm -hmm. is going to be doing your hiring, your firing. They are responsible for all staffing decisions. And the board is just responsible for saying, yes, you got what you needed done, right? They're not supposed to be giving that input. In our model, we want the board's input. We're asking for that. My board members are asked to sit in on those interviews. And when I have my final decision, right, my mostly final decision, I take that extra step and I take it back to the board and I say, here's who uh, we're looking at. Here are our top candidates. This is what I think. This is what I'm planning on offering. And I'm asking if any, you know, there are any red flags from the organization, from my staff below me, from the board higher up. Um, and so there's still that kind of extra piece of like making sure it works well, right? And there's that mm -hmm. extra piece of buy-in. Any other thoughts about how that might be different? Hiring staff might be different in a community governance model? What if you have co-leaders and two people? And say, Leah, Leah or Foster, do you either of you have any insight or or any questions about that? Realizing that the the, the other three of us are either presenting or or on the shareable team, so just wanted to give you an opportunity. No, just listening. Thank you for checking in. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So, what would happen if you have a co-director model, right? And I really like one candidate, but my co-director likes another candidate. And that seems like a good time to to work through the other stakeholders. Decision. Yep. yep. <laughs> right. Um, and that's why it's really, really important to make sure that you've locked down who's responsible, who has that final decision making authority, um, because you don't want to at the at the very last minute come in. <laughs> yep. Well, Kate, we've got the everybody else is going to be joining us because we've got about four minutes to the hour. So we want to welcome people back in. And then were you going to lead a quick just kind of check in about conversations? Yep. So, Excellent. So we're hitting kind of the reflection piece here. So after this exercise, hopefully you had some really good discussions and it, it opened up some doors and some thoughts you might not have um, 
might not have been kind of at the forefront of the logistical issues of community governance in your world. But after that exercise, what are some of the pitfalls and what are some of the benefits that you see to a community governance model? Feel free to toss them in the it, chat or just. It seems more responsive to the community if yeah. done well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, I would say if you if you want pitfalls, it's it's a lot more time consuming to gain consensus. It is. It's hugely more time consuming. So this model is not the most efficient model that is out there. It takes significant time to engage all the different stakeholders, and it takes a lot more pre planning to do it well, right? Because you have to have you have to have those charts. You have to think through those decision-making processes at all the points well in advance. <laughs> right? You can't fly by the seat of your pants as, as often. Let's look at other pitfalls. What are other issues that you came across? Pitfalls, deltas, whatever you want to call them. <laughs> Opportunities for improvement. Leanna, you're muted. I was going to say, as a perfectionist, I often have to be willing to just like let things be okay, like yeah. let them be good enough. Um, you know, let them be a compromise. <laughs> That's pretty pretty tricky. Huge imperfection, right? This is an imperfect model, so not every perspective is also going to come from like that same base of knowledge or expertise in X, right? If you're doing budgeting. Right. And all the voices at the table are coming in and they're saying, I think this is really important, but somebody doesn't know their income statement from their expense report. You have to take that into account. Right. So you can make a decision that's not quite ideal, especially if you're missing a key stakeholder. Right. And you can go, oh, we all think it'd be really great to do our accounting this way, but we don't have the accountant at the table. And whoops. <laughs> right. So it is imperfect. We have muddy waters, right? So how do you keep your brand identity cohesive and consistent when you have all these different voices, right? So how do you make sure that you're not going out and having mission creep? Um, it's ambiguous, right? It can be. So who is in charge? Who's accountable? It can be very easy for things to fall through the cracks because we don't have a designated John does A, right? <laughs> More voices equals mission creep. Uh, the other kind of side of that is with that open door for feedback. Stakeholders may feel more empowered to change or affect items that are not on the table, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, meetings, discussions, they can easily explode. It's very easy for your agenda to go out the window and for you to go, okay, we're two hours into this committee meeting. Did we discuss what we what we really needed to have done, right? Are we moving forward? Um, and so you really need to set clear agendas, have strong facilitators, right? I always tell people a lot of my job is herding cats. Right? That is 90% of what I do. It is cat herding. Um, limbo is another pitfall, right? So things take a long time and things can seem like they're in limbo forever, which can also disengage your stakeholders, right? We can't make decisions very quickly. And at a certain point, people, especially in, in you know the world we live in where I want an answer now, I need to know this. I, you can lose people. The other big piece is it requires open and honest communication, right? So you have to be able to equitably balance those loud voices and you have to be able to say what you really think. If you have all your stakeholders at the table are sitting here going, I don't know, I'm too afraid to talk, you know, to speak up. You're not gonna get anywhere with this model. What are some of the benefits? 
Um, so one of the things we chatted about for strategic goal setting is in a traditional model, you have an administrator who both plans and implements. So there's not really a ton of accountability. Um, and so having something that is more participatory, I think just by nature, there is more accountability built into that. Tons. Yeah, you have to build it in. And, and I have links in here so you can see how we track the accountability for like our strategic plan um, that you'll have access to so you can see, okay, who is in charge of, of talking through this and where does it live in the committee structure? We're more flexible, right? It's more adaptable. So organizations can change to meet the needs of your constituents. The people who started using our tool library 10 years ago are not necessarily the exact same people who use it today, right? We have to be able to, to meet the changing needs um, of our members and our, our demographics. What about DEI? So one of the huge benefits to this model is that those historically underrepresented and disenfranchised groups can gain much greater power and affect the systems, right? Um, change them so that they're more equitable for all constituents. And that is probably one of the biggest benefits here, right? Um, greater engagement and ownership of the organization within the organization, it moves kind of those relationships from transactional relationships, right? From that rental relationship to something that's a lot more collaborative that people have a lot more ownership of. Distributed voice means you can more genuinely connect with those diverse members of your stakeholders, right? And don't just think in terms of traditional DII, think of your first time homeowner, homeowner your gardener, your hobbyist woodworker, your crafters, your tradespeople, right? You can use all the shared experiences within your organization. Any other big benefits people can see or think of? It's honestly more fun, I found. You can just be more of like a normal human being without <laughs> having to be responsible for as much stuff. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I like to say like, we're creatures of habit, right? We like, we tend to do things X way because we've always done it that way, right? That's why we have best practices. And best practices are great. We can learn a lot from those models. Um, but imperfection and this DIY approach to decision making, right? It can encourage us to think a lot more critically about why we do X, right? Just think about reviewing your year-to-date budget, right? So how many of you have like reviewed a year-to-date budget with your board? Just like a little show of hands. All right. So think about that discussion and what that looks like when it's the same six board members being presented the info by the end, of, you know, by the ED month after month versus how that changes if just one more person is sitting in that meeting. Right. If one other stakeholder enters the door. Right. So if one of your donors comes into that meeting and is looking at that budget review, what are the issues they're going to pull up? What are the questions? What's that discussion going to be? Historically, what we've found is it's a lot more engaged. Right. It keeps us from rubber stamping whatever that activity, whatever that task is and really digging into the questions. So those are some of our some of our benefits and, and pitfalls. People find this useful? Good thought process. There's a lot of info. <laughs> and there are a lot of additional resources that will be um, listed in. Um, a few of them that I did put on here, just in terms of core cooperative governance models. Um, there is, if you're looking at cooperative governance, there's a great uh, primer from the UW Center um, in, in Wisconsin. There's a fabulous article specifically about co-leadership um, 
And then there, I also just included Joan Get um, Joan Gary's resources because she has a really great model where she's talking about specifically the board and that executive director or founder relationship. Um, she calls it a twin engine jet, right? So we all we have to be working together <laughs> um, to find some of those those traditional issues that that happen when our our boards and our staff members um, or whoever is in that for role are, are disengaged from one another. I'm looking over at, at the notes to see if I've missed anything in the chat. <laughs> Always cool to see folks from the UK. Lawrence, I just connected today with someone in London um, yeah. who has such a library. Hopefully you know about them already. Uh, not, not specifically in London, no. We're a little bit uh, about 30 miles north in, in a smaller village, but we've got a lending library. On, I, I sort of help uh, manage the fix-it days rather than the lending library specifically. But uh, yeah, delving into this is, is fascinating. So thanks for uh, for putting it on. Yeah, I think we'll take this. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, if there's a particular community governance like scenario that you're wondering, how might this play out in my organization or this is my pinch point, please feel free to reach out. I'm happy to kind of talk you through how we do X or how, what that looks like specific to the bylaws, you know, <laughs> how those things change. Um, I just went ahead and put your contact info perfect. in the chat. <laughs> um, well, I want to say thank you, everyone, for sticking around, for engaging in the breakouts and in this conversation. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, this whole set, all the recording, all the aspects of this recording will be shared. Uh, not only will we be sharing the presentation deck uh, and this video, but we will also be um, producing a transcript of this. And so if there's things that you want to go back, um, and then there's also going to be the chat record. So all of those things will be living on... Canvas and Candice um, will be sending out a, a, a note when all of that stuff is ready um, to be accessed, which should be early next week. It's the translation that takes a little, or the transcription that takes a little while to get back. Um, so again, this is one of, uh, this was our 15th session. We will be um, continuing to do these monthly until the end of the year. And we'll be following up with everyone who participated with information about the next session that will be on Tuesday, September 10th uh, at the same time, same link. And Miriam, if you've got any questions about uh, Shareable or the resources that we have and you want to stick around and ask some questions, we're going to keep this room open for a few minutes uh, longer just for Q&A if there's anything anybody else wants to discuss. Uh, as, yes, and Liana, I, I'm thinking that we will do <laughs> digital fundraising in October. Um, okay. and I need to circle back around, um, with, uh, Amanda to check in about doing the kind of grant aspect of fundraising, mm -hmm. which I think maybe we're going to do this next month. So we would oh, do okay, those cool. two fundraising sessions back to back. Um, cool. I just asked Darren right. if he was interested, um, cause Great. you know, he just got done with the big annual fundraiser. Um, yep. Our big capital campaign, not even annual. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he just, yeah, yeah. He, we were just chatting. You just wrapped up the annuals. Um, okay, got it. But yeah, they've they've done a lot of great crowdfunding. We our last CLA session was on crowdfunding, and I I just like looked through all the examples I could find. Yep. Um, cool. Yeah, and I'm gonna be so, talking. I'm gonna be visiting Amanda next month, so I can also pin her down. Great. I know she's in back to school mode right now. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Cool. Okay. All right. It's good to see you all. Yep. Take care. Thank you, Liana. Bye. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, Kate. Appreciate it. Oh, Lawrence just added Jay to the beginning of that link. For some reason, it's not including it. Uh, 
Thank you. I'll try that. <laughs> and I and I edited it was not put correctly in the slide deck, but I edited the link to make sure that it will go to the right place. I think that's what happened because I think you copied it from there. Mm -hmm. Um and the forwarding was not right there. So it should be correct that now. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that works lovely. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Any last questions or points of discussion before we close the room? I was just going to ask out of curiosity how the discussion went in the other breakouts. <laughs> well, people are really excited about the strategic goals, um, but we spent some time trying to get to know each other. Yeah. So we did. <laughs> We didn't get to it, um, but people were really um, just in their introduction sharing why. And so I feel like if we would have got there, the conversation would have been really, really good and rich. Uh, but the intros took a, it took a second. Yeah. You never know in the groups, like how far they're going to get into the nuts and bolts or if they're going to be awfully quiet. So <laughs> that group also had more than half of our participants yes. all went to that. So it was, I think, not quite enough time to, to get to know each other and get to the subject matter. Mm -hmm. Know it to self, strategic yeah. planning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I'm, I'm going to head off. Thanks, guys. Thanks yep. very much. Thank yeah. You, have, 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 have a good night, Lawrence. I'm really good. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, guys. Okay. You have a great day. All right. Bye. 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 Thank you. <laughs>